Go ahead and get started, everybody. If you can find a seat, get yourself a drink, but please find a seat and we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to St. Patrick's Parish. My name is Doug Quinn. I think I know many of you. I'm pleased to serve as the convening chairman for the ACD general meeting today. At this time, I would like to recognize the following new members who have joined the ACD during the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Chuck and Marl Monaco of St. Columkill Parish in Papillion, who joined in July, and Brent and Michelle Pullman of St. Gerald Parish in Ralston, who joined in August. Let's give them a round of applause for joining. Uh, I would like to ask now that we keep the following former ACD member in our prayers. Uh, Michael Hogan, who passed away on August 7th. Please pray also for the following deceased family members of ACED ACD members. Arvid Sorensen, father of Ken Sorensen, who passed away on April 21st. Carl Nazarala, uh, my father-in-law, the father of my wife Margaret, who passed away on May 5th. John Krupski, the father of Jane Kirstenbrock, who passed away on May 8th. Lawrence Schweitz, the father of former ACD member Greg Schweitz, who passed away on June 30th. John Horgan, father of Ann Rayner, who passed away on July 28th. And Della McCoy, mother of Kevin McCoy, who passed away on August 14th. Uh, we're gonna start with an opening prayer. And after our prayer, we invite you to join the cocktail buffet and conversation with one another. To lead us in prayer, I would like to welcome Archbishop Lucas, who is in his eighth year, it's hard to believe, as Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Omaha. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for being here uh, this evening. Thanks to Father Belt in a special way for the, uh, the warm Fremont hospitality on this beautiful late summer day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. We give thanks, Heavenly Father, for the beauty of this day, for the bounty of the earth, for all those who have been working so hard to provide the resources of food for us and uh, for our neighbors, for people throughout the world. And for those who work so hard to provide other material resources for our welfare and for the works of the church. We pray that we might always be good stewards of what has been entrusted uh, to us by you in, in your goodness. We thank you for this time to be together and for all the good that the ACD accomplishes year after year, continue to bless us, bless our members, especially bless those who are sick or who are carrying heavy burdens. <clears throat> Help us with the grace of the Holy Spirit as uh, we have the opportunity to listen and discuss this evening, to understand more about the life of our archdiocese, the opportunities that are ours in Christ, and with the Spirit's help to understand always your will for us as we move into the future. We thank you for the food that is provided. Bless us and the food that we are about to receive from your goodness through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'd like to bring up uh, our host, Father Dave Belt, who hasn't had a chance to even have one bite of his food yet. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to St. Patrick. It is uh, awesome to have you here tonight. Our people love to host different uh, archdiocesan events and meetings and gatherings here, so uh, please make yourself at home. Uh, we're very proud of our, of our church, of our beautiful space to honor and worship God. Uh, and I am very honored and very humbled to be uh, the pastor of such a, a wonderful and diverse community. We have about 7,200 members and we have a, a growing Hispanic population and so a, a part of our, our prayer and discernment uh, in, the, in our parish council has been how do we minister uh, to our, uh, our Hispanic brothers and sisters and many of them who come to the parish and who live here in Fremont um, are working poor and so we are uh, continuing to have a conversation about uh, how we can best care for them and help them to, uh, uh, to live uh, good and dignified lives. And uh, we really are, are talking um, among the leadership here about how we can be one parish. 
uh, there can be some divisions, as you know, uh, and we are talking uh, about how we can be one, uh, how we can uh, just be a, one family of faith. And so I ask you to pray for us as we do that important work. Uh, a part of our outreach to our Hispanic families uh, is uh, to begin the Latino enrollment uh, initiative here uh, at Archbishop Bergen Catholic School. Uh, we have hired a young woman to work in our our, uh, Hispanic ministry, but she will also be serving eight to ten hours a week at Bergen to be uh, a part of the advancement staff there and to work with our Spanish speaking families to encourage them to consider uh, being a part of the Bergen family. And so it is uh, it's very exciting to uh, begin that uh, important work. Uh, Archbishop Bergen Catholic School is an important piece of our parish. Uh, just uh, about ten years ago, uh, they made, the parishioners made uh, an important decision to, uh, to begin the elementary school program once again. It had closed in 1975 and so uh, they made that important decision to, uh, to begin um, our elementary school program once again. And uh, tonight I'm happy to report that our enrollment preschool through 12th grade is 455 students. And so we have had a 5% increase in our enrollment over the past year. Uh, part of our Bergen program Uh, a part of our, our Bergen program that has just started in the last couple of weeks is uh, uh, a renewed preschool program. And so we have a preschool for three and four year olds and we now have a pre-kindergarten program for five year olds. And it is curriculum based. It is to prepare um, our young people for kindergarten. And so that has been a, a new uh, program that has been instituted here. Uh, we have also started a, a year round daycare program of beginning at, at age three. Hopefully within the year we will have that expanded to newborns. Um, I told the parish that as soon as um, Father Elliot, our new associate pastor, learns how to change diapers, we will uh, we'll open the, the, new, the newborn daycare program. Uh, once again, this is an amazing, vibrant family of faith. Um, I'm very honored and very humbled to be a part of uh, the St. Patrick family. Uh, we have many generous uh, parishioners and uh, many people who are role models for me of how to live faith. And so I am very blessed and very excited about uh, where we are in this uh, wonderful crossroads uh, of life. And I just um, invite you to, uh, to enjoy your evening and to uh, please pray for uh, the people of St. Patrick's Parish. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Our first presenter tonight is Jill Peterson, uh, the chair of the ACD Advancement Committee. Jill and her husband Terry are members of Christ the King Parish and were the hosts of the Archbishop's Dinner for Education patron party held at their home on July 27th. Jill will preview the important plans for the 2016-17 Archbishop's Annual Appeal. Please welcome Jill Peterson. Thanks, Doug. Good evening. Good evening. I love being Catholic. I love the Holy Trinity. I love our Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. I love our schools. I love our priests. I love the Holy Father. I love the bishops, especially Archbishop George Lucas, who leads our, his flock fearlessly and faithfully. That's my story. Each and every one of you has a story, a story of faith as well. And that's this year's theme for the Archbishop's Annual Appeal. Your story is our story of faith. The Archdiocese of Omaha is the name of a very large family. It is a family of Catholics and the people with whom we share our lives and our love. Each of us has a personal story of faith. Here are just four stories of faith from across the Archdiocese. Stories made possible in part by your generosity to the Archbishop's annual appeal. I always valued marriage, and I always knew that marriage was an important thing, but I, 
I think that even in the Catholic Church, it's, a, it's even greater. <laughs> like a, it is a sacrament. Uh, it's a permanent vocation, like this is a lifelong commitment. Um, so I really encourage people to help support these programs, uh, help couples like us, uh, and, and understanding like the permanence, but also like how to work in that vocation. Uh, these pro programs are really crucial. We wouldn't be what we are. We wouldn't be able to break out of that shell and be somebody that that we weren't before we came to the one year. Well, the the one year was like a one-stop shop. You come here, if you don't know how to speak English, they teach you how to speak English. If like the nutrition class, um, the art classes, if you want to learn how to, how to do crochet or how to, how to sew or how to make bags, I can speak maybe for maybe other women that we are so grateful that they are here because they help us get through some of the struggles that we may have and become somebody else that we never thought we would be. In high school, I had the experience of being kind of like a big fish in a little pond in terms of being the, the faith guy. Once I got to seminary, I had 120 brothers who were all amazingly talented. So many gifts, they were using them to glorify God. Learning that I was God's son and I had my own gifts and I am able to use them with my brothers and their gifts for God's greater glory. Um, another big challenge for me was uh, confession for the first time. I learned that confession is a good thing. Scary, but good. Um, wonderful. And good doesn't even cover it. It was amazing. And it also taught me that I'm, I'm not alone. Gave me friends and different people that I could talk to and outreach to. Uh, the feeling afterwards. I just felt this rush just setting up a bonfire in me. It was the best feeling ever. You have just heard four stories of faith from some of our neighbors in the Archdiocese of Omaha. All of these stories share a common theme. Every person, every family, in good times and in bad, is invited to experience the powerful beauty of our Catholic faith. Everyone is invited to a path of growth and holiness. I'm sure your life is filled with stories of great joy, deep love, and strong faith. For some, the pace of life may be difficult to bear. In my ministry, I learn of the joys and struggles that people face every day. I'm always particularly moved when I witness the sacrifices made by teachers, parents, and pastors to share the life of the gospel with our young people so that they have the opportunity to come to know Jesus in a personal way and have life in Him. Our story of faith is lived out in our homes and neighborhoods, in classrooms, churches, and outreach centers throughout Northeast Nebraska. Your story and mine are part of this great story of God's love and mercy. I'm asking today for your support of the Archbishop's annual appeal. Your generosity will help our schools, parishes, and ministries tell the remarkable story of God's tenderness and mercy, His grace and fidelity, His forgiveness and love. With your support of the annual appeal, more people will be able to meet Jesus and in Him find their way home to heaven. Thank you for your support. These are just a few of the thousands of stories that make up the work of Christ happening here in Northeast Nebraska. In Luke's Gospel today, Jesus says, To the other towns also I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, because for this purpose I have been sent. Jesus was sent to proclaim the good news of God to all of the towns, and we are called to proclaim the good news of God to all who live 
in our 23 counties. Archbishop Lucas charged the Advancement Committee with bolstering the Archbishop's annual appeal. In the three years I've been serving on the committee, I've come to believe that the annual appeal is the best kept secret and the least understood of all fundraisers in the Archdiocese. The annual appeal pays for 20% of the overall operating budget of the Archdiocese, so it pays 20% of everything the Archdiocese does. Last year the appeal raised three and a half million dollars and that was with the participation of only 18% of the households in the Archdiocese. 18%. Consider the possibilities if that number doubled. It would mean that less of the budget would need to come from parish assessments. The Advancement Committee has worked with the Stewardship and Development Office to come up with some strategies to increase participation in the annual appeal. A pastor's advisory committee was introduced to provide feedback from pastors about the best way to facilitate the appeal in their parishes. A leadership program was expanded that asked pastors to identify lay leaders in the parish who could help facilitate the appeal. <coughs> the Advancement Committee also encouraged the creation of a guest speaker program. And over the course of two weekends in September last year, Archdiocesan staff spoke at masses in parishes across the state to help explain the impact of the appeal on their ministry. 24 members of the Curia spoke at 42 parishes at 111 masses. Which brings me to the, one of the reasons I'm talking to you tonight. The Advancement Committee would like to invite all of you to consider representing Archbishop Lucas at your own parish or perhaps at another if that suits you. We would like you to share your story. We have found that when the mystery of where the money goes when checks are written to the Archbishop's annual appeal is cleared up for people, it helps, it helps if they hear it from a fellow parishioner. If you're interested in joining our guest speaker effort, there is a sign-up sheet at the table at the entrance, or you can chat with Bree or Tom or Shannon about it. Finally, the, the Advancement Committee would also like to invite all of you to support this year's annual appeal. I know that the vast majority of you already do so, and very generously, and for that, we're very grateful. It just seems fitting that we have 100% participation by the members of the Archbishop's Committee for Development for the Archbishop's annual appeal. Thank you for making your story part of our story of faith. God bless you. Thank you, Jill. That video was really a, really a, a good tool. I think it was very, very well done. Um, I'm going to be introducing our next speaker, who is not Patrick Slattery. Uh, Patrick was supposed to be here tonight, uh, but a family uh, emergency uh, is keeping him away. So our next speaker is going to be pulling, pitching a double hitter, a double header tonight. Uh, Shannon's going to cover the uh, significant impact of the $14 million already awarded to our Catholic schools uh, from the Ignite the Faith Capital campaign. Uh, we, we'd love to have Patrick here, but I'm sure Shannon can do a very good job on that. After that. Uh, Shannon, who is in her sixth year as the Director of the Stewardship and Development Office, will offer an update on the Stewardship and Development Office activities. Please join me in extending a grateful welcome to our very talented, hardworking Director of the Stewardship and Development Office, Shannon Brommer. Thank you, Doug, very much. I know that um, Patrick is very disappointed to not be here this evening, um, and so hopefully we'll, we will get the good news to you nonetheless, and um, we'll be seeing him again at another activity. So um, I really am excited to talk about the impact the Ignite the Faith campaign has had on this archdiocese. It's been really remarkable uh, to watch the funds we put to use in such significant ways. And Doug mentioned 14 million, but we're actually up to 16 million now. So I just got to use this about 30 minutes ago, so we'll see how it works. <laughs> So as many of you know, most of you know, in um, 2012, we launched the Ignite the Faith Capital Campaign. It had been um, decades since we had uh, conducted a large uh, capital campaign for the Archdiocese, and it um, was composed of a number of really important priorities, but significantly uh, focused on our Catholic schools. 
As you know, the goal was originally $40 million, and thanks to the amazing generosity of so many people, we did raise 50, over $53 million in, in p commitments and pledges, or pledges and gifts. And to date, we've received almost, well, over $37 million. Um, so we're right on schedule in our uh, receipt of those gifts. And to date, we've distributed over $27 million. And as you may recall, Archbishop Lucas, when he talked about this campaign, it really was a um, gifts come in and gifts go out. So uh, we work to distribute the funds as quickly as possible, mostly on a quarterly basis as they go out to parishes and schools for their 10 and 40 percent distribution. But to date, over 16 million has been awarded, or excuse me, distributed to our Catholic schools. So first is our, uh, what is called here our needs-based grants, and we call them our excellence grants. And uh, the goal was to raise seven and a half, or to provide seven and a half million dollars for those grants. And four, over four million dollars has been awarded so far and distributed 2.6, almost 2.7. And the, um, the funds that are awarded, they just haven't been, they just haven't fully used those dollars yet. So they've been, they've received, the schools have received the grants, but they just haven't used all those dollars, but they're available for them when they need them. So 46 of our 70 Catholic schools have received funding from the Excellence Fund. Um, and in order to, to apply, the school must have a strategic plan. And this has been critical to this whole process. And it's kind of kept the process slow because so many of our schools did not have a strategic plan. So this was an off, awesome impetus to ensure that these schools are really thinking about their future um, in important ways. And so then the grant needs to align with that strategic plan. So great things have resulted um, from those, I guess there's nothing up there. So 26 of our schools, both urban and rural, have um, received grants and they have been used to upgrade technology um, infrastructure, which is a really big component of these excellence grants. So 26 of the schools are, are getting new infrastructure, new technology, hardware, software, uh, just to make sure that they are um, up to date in their technology. But then other grants that have been awarded um, have afforded schools to hire new staff, such as development directors, recruitment directors, special ed teachers, um, to offer um, really important facility upgrades. Uh, when we were at Gross in the spring, you saw some of the impact the Ignite the Faith uh, grant had on their school. Um, St. James um, has just opened a brand new preschool, and uh, which is, you know, as you know, an important pipeline for enrollment. Um, Lindsay, a new gym gym um, lobby for their gym, uh, which they're really excited about. Um, expanding ESL and reading programs, and then of course providing tuition assistance to families in need. So these are just a few of the things that are being used with those um, excellence grant dollars. So then our marketing initiative, um, we had slated $2 million for this program. And um, this was really an important piece of this campaign. It's something that the Archdiocese had never done on a full-blown um, full scale to, to really talk about Catholic education in this Archdiocese. It had every little school and had to do their own marketing um, efforts and so there was disjointed and there, were, um, there was confusion. People really didn't understand that they were welcome um, to our schools and so this was really the Awaken Greatness campaign has been focused focused on uh, building awareness and understanding about our Catholic schools and who and who is welcome that everyone who is welcome and how they can afford it. Um, so the when this started, enrollment in the archdiocese had really experienced a decrease um, for 17 consecutive years, which is just uh, really the norm across the country. So this campaign, the Awaken Greatness effort, was launched in 2014, and just one year later, the trend has changed, and the streak of decline has ended. 
Um, the, the campaign included uh, just a lot of really great efforts, 75 print ads, 22 print other print communications, uh, five different radio spots, um, substantial Pandora presence, uh, to television ads, um, you know, and all of these things were throughout the archdiocese. And for those of us who are not in that target market of about 30-year-old women, <laughs> thought we might, um, in a second I'll show you a couple of the ads since uh, I know I didn't get to see them very often. <laughs> but in addition to that mass media effort, we knew it would not be as effective if we didn't have a strong grassroots effort at the same time. So we launched the Ambassador Program. And that's where we, we put together a great packet of, of materials and information and training opportunities for our schools to use to help tell their own story um, at, the, at their particular school level. So we had the, the mass media building awareness, but then the um, efforts at the ground um, going out into, and parents talking to parents. Um, and that was hugely effective, especially with the Welcome Grant Program. Um, as of today, there are 222 new students um, who have enrolled in, our, in 21 different schools who participated in the Welcome Grant Program. And that's a program where uh, schools will offer a two-year grant of $1,500, essentially a $1,000 reduction on your tuition for year one and $500 on your, on, for year two. And that's for students coming into our Catholic schools from public schools essentially or from non-Catholic schools. So that has been wonderfully successful. So here are these nice ads. has definitely uh, made an impact and in, in talking not only about you know awakening greatness but those biggest subjects um, what really does happen in our Catholic schools uh, that we know cannot happen in public schools so as I mentioned earlier um, about the the school level grassroots effort along with the mass media efforts um, we really have seen great results so you might recall this time last year Patrick was able to announce an increase in enrollment for the very first time in 17 years so we went from 18,911 students in this archdiocese in 2014 to 19,500 this time last year and while we don't know the total system enrollment uh, right now we will in a few weeks we do know a couple of things um, the consortium schools once again are up over a hundred students just in those schools um, we heard from Father Belt, 5% increase here in Fremont. Other urban schools are seeing an increase. We know that St. Bernard's and Holy Name are seeing great enrollment gains. And this really is bucking the trend in urban education. You just don't see that anywhere else in the country. So we know great things are happening, not only from the advertising side, but, then, but also just um, all the hard work that, it, that is happening at the at the at the ground level so another really important um, component of 
uh, the Ignite the Faith campaign was to support our teachers. Uh, we heard during the town hall meetings people really wanted to increase the, the pay that our teachers were receiving, but we knew that that wasn't sustainable. We knew that, that if we you know, just bumped up everybody's uh, pay rate, then, how, then the school would be charged with, with maintaining that. And so we um, came up with the with um, an opportunity for teachers to go back to school to uh, get an additional degree or enhance their um, their educational level so that hopefully their salaries would increase and that would typically be the case in our schools. So right now 106 teachers from 49 different um, Catholic schools have received funding um, in order to pursue those advanced degrees so a hundred um, to the 106 teachers I mean that's really exciting to think how many teachers are are um, being educated um, through this program in, and in hopes of increasing their salary but also to to bring great things back to their schools and this, uh, in addition, 37 of these teachers are studying for their administration degrees. And we know that that pipeline for administrators has been very, very um, empty in recent years. And so this was a very particular program to help fix that issue. The woman in this photograph, um, her name is San the woman on the right is Sandy Williams. And she is the new principal of St. Michael's School in South Sioux City. And she is the first um, graduate of the of the administrators program to be hired in a in as a principal in a in one of our Catholic schools, and then it just so happens the woman who's to her right, um, Zulelma Nuno, is St. Michael's new development director, and that was fund her position was funded by the um, excellence grant. So great things are happening up there. So. Um, other programs uh, that the t teachers are studying, um, history, Spanish education, curriculum instruction, counseling, math, um, you can read these exciting new programs and enhancements that, that will be at our schools as a result of the teacher scholarship fund. So as you can see at the top, we have a goal of a million dollars, 785,000 have, have been awarded. So I have a quick message from Sandy. I have worked a lot with the administration very closely over the years. Some due to need, some due to just wanting to help out, do what's best for the school. So a lot of my education, I knew I didn't have to do a lot of background in digging for a lot of my classes, so that was really an asset. I saw the work that Donna has built up in the last five years, and I didn't want to see it go to waste. Because there were a lot of years that we almost closed through the very poor administration. So when things were starting to build back up, I wanted to see it continue, and got rid of my, I guess, in my path to see that it continues. So I think seeing the growth in the students and being a part of that, you know, I've taught eighth grade for five years, fourth grade before that. And I guess I want to see a bigger picture, not just the students that I have, the five to eight students that I have, but from preschool on up, I want to see those steps and the maturity and the growth and the living faith throughout the whole school. I've been in Catholic education since I was five. I've been in grade school, high school, and college, and I've always taught in Catholic school, so a faith is a part of me. It's, it's who I am. It's not what I do. It's, it's who I am. So. I want to continue that, help the students and the families grow as a community and become one. So about the generous donations and benefactors of Catholic education, that wouldn't be possible for me. And I know St. Michael's going to be here today. Okay. Mm. All right, she's very excited to get started in her new role. Okay, also, um, to support our rural schools, as you might recall, 40% of the funds that were raised in our rural parishes um, are then, when the funds come in, are then returned to those schools, to, to those parishes to be used for Catholic education. And so to date, um, $3,484 million have gone back to those schools. So there are 32 
rural Catholic schools, um, educating almost 4,000 students. And these funds are being used in a variety of ways. Um, building upgrades and renovation, recarpeting classrooms, updating security systems, replacing 50-year-old student desks, um, just a lot of really neat things. And these funds were not um, designated for anything. They could use these funds as they saw fit in those schools. But then other, um, you know, offering classroom resources and, of course, tuition assistance. And then, of course, to, to um, another important uh, goal is to launch the, um, the consortium schools in Omaha. And uh, Sandy mentioned Donna. Uh, Donna Bishop had been the principal um, at St. Michael's, and then she was hired uh, by Patrick to be assistant superintendent. And then she is also um, working as the executive director for the consortium schools and doing some really great work there. Um, so as you know, we consolidated eight schools into five um, schools to create uh, the Omaha Consortium Schools. And the investments um, have been used in really important ways for these schools. Um, new consortium-wide reading and religion curriculum, great um, building improvement, improvements, air conditioning in all the schools, new gym floors, um, and I know that under, under Donna's leadership, she has just done a great job of kind of making the consortium an educational laboratory. They're testing a, a number of, of programs related to blended learning and other efforts that um, they're kind of testing them there and really making, tweaking, making them work. And then we're finding that other schools are wanting to take on those programs. So it's a great opportunity for um, testing out some, some exciting things that I think are going to impact the entire archdiocese. I shouldn't have passed on that last note. Um, really important to all of this is that the enrollment at the consortium schools now is higher than it was when there were eight schools. So they're doing very well. They're pretty much at capacity right now. So it's pretty exciting to see um, the great growth in those five schools. Uh, and then, as you know, um, Q's was supported uh, with um, a goal of five million dollars. Nearly four, um, well, 4.85 have uh, been has been distributed to the schools. Um, in 2012, they, they expanded uh, their role of serving Urban uh, Sacred Heart by also uh, serving Holy Name and All Saints School. So that was a a, a great. Um, step for them, a big job, and they're doing a terrific, a terrific job of doing so. So mostly the Ignite the Faith funds are to, to support their buildings. And it was um, kind of ironic that last year um, all three of the schools, their boilers went out. So thus the ribbon cutting in front of a boiler. <laughs> But, um, you know, I just felt terrible about that, thinking they were so excited about their plans for $5 million, and then they, and each boiler was a million dollars, and, but then they are, were just like, well, if we didn't have it, what, we'd be closing the schools. So this really was, you know, a, a true godsend uh, to these schools. And again, their enrollment is up as well. So it's ex exciting to see that. And then finally, um, the School of Faith uh, was launched in 2013 and 14. And this is a program really for the teachers. It's, it's a half a day, once a month, where the teachers are together to grow in their faith. It's guided uh, by wonderful instructors, and it's not about what they're going to take back to the classroom. It's completely about their own heart, their own relationship with Jesus Christ. And, but we do know, as they grow in their faith, the impact that is going to have on that entire school. So it really has been uh, very well received. Um, <clears throat> the funds for the School of Faith are to provide three years of the School of Faith program to every school. 
So it was launched in 2013-14 uh, uh, in the south, um, seven of the South Omaha schools, and then the next year it moved to um, encompass all of the urban and uh, all of the urban schools as well as Columbus. And then last year, all schools participated in the program. And thankfully, we have the funds uh, so that those original. Uh, schools will be able to have a fourth year um, of the um, School of Faith program. But then um, at the end of, of the funds, um, can I go back? Maybe not. Um, so as the funds are de um, depleted uh, from Ignite the Faith, we will be evaluating to see if it's a program that uh, we want to continue. So it seems like it is, but we'll, we'll take a peek at that. So. Um, I hope you can see that Ignite the Faith, 16 plus million dollars in all of our schools is just making an amazing difference. Um, and I really have to commend and thank Patrick for his efforts to ensure that these dollars are being used strategically. They're not being used frivolously, they are making an impact. Um, and one thing that I've heard him say that I didn't expect this, but that another outcome of these funds is the improvement of the morale in these schools. And I would have never thought about that, but when you think about it, it makes sense. There, and Bonnie Hickey can tell you a story about this, that her grandson was going to start at St. Bernard's, but they were afraid the school was going to close, so they didn't transfer. So now these schools are feeling like we're going to be around for a while, and so there's a little that kind of confidence, and then also that all these people want to be part of us. They want to support us. They want to make it work for us, and they care about our schools. So. Um, we are very blessed, and you, as members of the ACD, have made an amazing impact on ensuring that these dollars have, have done good for our schools. So, that's Patrick's program. <laughs> Now, the notes are bigger and I don't need the glasses, so that'll help. As you're walking away, Father Bill, I fail to say thank you uh, for your warm hospitality. They always do such a nice job here of creating such a warm environment, so thank you. So just a few things um, related to the Stewardship and Development Office. Um, thanks to Jill for that wonderful presentation and to the entire Advancement Committee. They've really been a great resource for us. Um, she mentioned a number of the strategies being implemented this year. Uh, but in addition to that, I wanted to let you know that one new, other new thing that we've started, uh, or launched, introduced our general chairs. We've never had general chairs for the Archbishop's Annual Appeal. So I'm happy to announce that Suzanne and Jim Hillen from St. Isidore in Columbus and Joanne and Tom Karens um, of St. Vincent de Paul in Omaha have taken on this important role. So we're very grateful for their leadership and if you see them, know them, thank you for offering your, our gratitude. So the Newman Center, Archbishop's going to talk a little bit about, not Archbishop's going to talk about that, but I did want to say um, thank you to those of you who have supported the Newman Center. We had our groundbreaking just a couple, or excuse me, our ribbon cutting just a couple of weeks ago, and it was just a fabulous day, and there have been so many people who have worked so hard to make this happen, and we know it is just going to make a, an enormous difference. Um, grateful for your prayers. We do have... Um, some work to do yet to uh, raise all the dollars necessary, but we're getting very close. A couple of things related to the Archbishop's Committee for Development. It was suggested by the Leadership Committee uh, that we offer, actually I think it was Joe Schwaller, um, that we offer an executive summary of the committee minutes. Um, and so those are at your, at your places. So it's a, just a, a quick summary of some of the high points of the um, committee meetings that have occurred since our last general meeting. I wanted to mention that the pictures 
that are in some of these materials. Most of them are from Fremont Bergen students. Uh, related to the committees, and these, these next few months are going to be important for them, um, during October and November, each of the committees will be facilitating a goal setting process. So that was something that came from this strategic planning process uh, to really take a look at um, each of the committees, what their functions, what, how they're functioning, and how they can be more um, targeted in their efforts. So we will be um, hosting those uh, again in October and November. Uh, as you know, we host a um, Arch, Archdiocesan Steward and Stewardship and Development Networking and Education Series um, each year, and we have brochures out on the table if you um, need more information, but we've uh, had two programs since our last general meeting. We hosted a planned giving workshop right here um, on June 16th, and ACD members Mark Prince and Jeremy Belsky were two of the presenters. And we had 50 participants. We were really pre pleased with the turnout and the information that was garnered. And then we hosted a roundtable discussion and networking event uh, in July at St. Bernard's, and 40 um, folks who were involved in stewardship and development attended that, and that's always well received, just a chance for them to connect with one another um, and to learn best practices from each other. <clears throat> Our next workshop is in October at Creighton University, and the topic will be on communicating your advancement program to your internal and external audiences. Um, and as always, thank you for encouraging um, volunteers, staff, pastors, principals, and your parishes and schools to attend these. Uh, we really are seeing an impact as those folks are learning um, the skills and the making the connections that they need to impact their parishes and schools. The Archbishop's Dinner for Education uh, will be coming up here on September 29th. Um, Doug mentioned that Jill and Terry Peterson hosted the patron party in July, and it was really wonderful. Not only was there a great crowd, but everyone got to meet the honorees for the first time, and that's always especially um, special. <clears throat> So do mark your calendars for the 29th. Uh, we hope you can join us for this wonderful celebration of Catholic education. Um, in the past, we have put together tables for ACD members. So if you would like to sit with fellow ACD members, just let us know. And if you have any questions about the dinner or how you can get involved, you can talk to Caitlin Maloney, who's um, matching the tablecloths tonight. So. <laughs> um, just a couple other things. Um, estate planning, uh, those of you who have named um, the archdiocese in your estate plans, you are members of the Heritage Society. And I just wanted to remind you that each month a mass is said for all Heritage Society members somewhere in the archdiocese. And Ron Worthington facilitates this and usually represents you there as you're being prayed for. Uh, and then also has a chance to encourage those um, parishioners to consider leaving the um, archdiocese or its, any of its apostolates in their estate plans. So I really do thank Ron for that, that good work. And then finally, um, this is always a meaningful time in the archdiocese as we send um, the annual distribution from the OAEF, from the Omaha Archdiocesan Education Foundation and Parish Foundation. Uh, there are currently 185 endowed accounts within, that found, within those foundations. And in addition to the funds that go directly to parishes and schools, there are funds for grants for Catholic education and tuition assistance for elementary and high schools. So in a few weeks, we will be distributing $1.2 million to our parishes and schools through that foundation. It was, the foundation was established 40 years ago, and we really are the beneficiary of those who had the foresight to establish these endowments, those who continue to support them. Um, you know it's always a sacrifice when you're thinking, we need the money now, but to put it into an endowment so that it can be used in perpetuity is a, um, a real gift to all of us. So um, we're very grateful for a terrific investment finance committee who helps with the oversight of that foundation and to make sure that those dollars are going to be around for a long, long time. 
So, you've heard enough from me. So, thank you very much for all your good work and your support of the Stewardship and Development Office. Uh, we certainly could not do it without you. Thank you. We'll let Shannon get some well-earned rest now. Uh, Archbishop Lucas will now provide an update on the pastoral envisioning process, ongoing par parish pastoral planning, and other notable archdiocesan priorities. Archbishop Lucas, the podium is yours. Um, I don't have a fancy presentation up on the screen. I feel like I should do a soft shoe or something again. Um, break up the program a little. We shared a lot of information with you, but, but isn't it good information? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm so proud of what we're being uh, able these years to do uh, with and for our schools. Uh, and it's not by accident, it's thanks to your generosity and the help of, of many, many others like you and really good leadership. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Patrick isn't here this, this evening, he's got a great reason for, that he isn't here, but uh, I'd like for him to sort of get some congratulations from all, from all of you for, for what he's uh, doing. Be um, we'll, we'll pass that along. Uh, uh, along to them. As, as Shannon mentioned, we're, you know, we've been so blessed with the generosity of these resources that are provided for our schools and we really want to make sure that they're well used and Patrick is all over that and, and uh, particularly with the excellence grants, we really want them to be an incentive for, for greater excellence uh, in, uh, in, in our schools. And, and that's really what I, uh, what I see in our schools individually when I visit them and when we look at the, at the picture as a whole, we know that Catholic education is such an important part of life in this archdiocese, but we're determined that it be excellent and that it, it not uh, be diminished uh, year by year, that, that it, it, we continue to serve more families if, if, uh, if that's possible, and that uh, what they receive, what the students and, and the, the parents receive together is, is excellent in, in every way in terms of instruction, in terms of the atmosphere, in terms of the respect, uh, and in terms of the um, sharing of, of the Catholic faith, of the light of the gospel one, one generation uh, to the next. So uh, um, really, I, my, uh, my hope is that we, uh, we uh, sort of duplicate what we see in, the, in our academic excellence and our sports programs and other things. We know that we could do all that well. We really want these to be schools of evangelization also, and uh, they are in many ways, and we're, we're offering the School of Faith for our teachers so that they can grow in, in, in their own faith uh, for, the, for their benefit, uh, for their own benefit and for their families, but then for those, for those that, uh, that they serve. But we really w want the, these schools to, to be the, the place where uh, our students meet Jesus. In a, in a very personal way. Uh, I have the privilege of celebrating the Mass of the Holy Spirit at several high schools, usually at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the school year. I've been at Scott Catholic, I was with Duchenne the other day, and, and then yesterday at, at Creighton Prep, and I'm saying more or less the same thing every place, that as I see the opportunity that, that is there for the students in these schools, the, the opportunity that's really at the center of it all is the opportunity to come to know Jesus to not only know about him, and it's very important that we know about him so that we recognize him when we do meet him, uh, but, but for the, uh, our students to have the, the opportunity to have, to have a personal relationship with the Lord, to learn how to pray, to learn how much the Lord cares about each one of them. Uh, he, he knows the same thing about them as he knows about you and me. He knows we're not perfect, uh, but he wants to be with us in, in everything. And he's not afraid of our imperfections and our confusions and, and our doubts, even our sins. Um, and uh, the Lord desires, again, not just to kind of hang around with our young people, but he wants a friendship with them, wants to know them personally and have, have them know him. So that's possible in our schools in a way that, that, that's not so much uh, in, uh, in other places in, in our culture these days. So um, I'm so proud of, of, of what we have in the schools and, and so proud of what's still possible that, that we can continue to, to grow into. But our schools have always run on sacrifice, and that's just as true today as it, as it has always been. And I'm so grateful for your sacrifice, for the sacrifice of parents, uh, parishioners, our, our, our parish priests, uh, and, and some of our benefactors who you know, have never had association with our schools, haven't had students there, haven't had their own children in the schools, but see the, the blessing for, for the whole community and, and uh, are so willing to, um, to, uh, to uh, support what, uh, what we're doing. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Shannon and to, to your collaborators in, in your office for stewardship and development, most of them here this evening, not just for making this a nice evening for us, but for 
making so much of what uh, you have been talking about uh, about possible. And to think that just within the last several years, we've been able to provide over $37 million in uh, resources uh, for our retired priests, um, for our parishes, religious education, but primarily for, for our Catholic schools. And uh, we're working hard to uh, continue to be in, in uh, communication with the people who have uh, committed the 53 million. Uh, we, we'd like to think we, could, we can still receive uh, most of that. So we, we want to be transparent uh, with all of you and, and letting you know that we have already received 37 million. I think we're going to, you know, not sort of blast that information around because I, um, I've heard from a couple of people saying that uh, we heard you're already at your goal, so we don't think we have to, you know, continue making our, our, our commitment. So, you know, the commitment, as you recall is that whatever comes in over the 40 million will continue to go to these same uh, grants and programs in the same proportion that, that was originally there. So we can use all of that. There's so, so much more good that, that, uh, that can be done. But I'm so grateful and, and um, the, uh, for the generosity and so proud that we have uh, people guiding the, um, the disbursement of the funds and the use of the funds that, we, that they really are having uh, an important, uh, important impact. Uh, Shannon mentioned the, the Newman Center. Uh, it's um, uh, up and running at 71st and Pacific, the Newman Center at UNO. Uh, I really hope um, before too long you'll have the opportunity to visit. Maybe we'll be able to have one of our meetings there uh, be, uh, before too long so you, you can see it. Some of you I know have, um, have, have been there. We have over 100 uh, students and residents, about 105 or six, something like that. Uh, we have room for um, about 40 more. Uh, we've actually got more uh, young men than, than women. Mo a, a pretty, we're not quite full for the men's rooms, but, but most of them, that's kind of a surprise uh, to me, but, but, um, but a good surprise. So we have a residential uh, hall there for about 160 students. But really, uh, common areas, nice meeting places, a library, places for all the UNO students to gather. We want all of them to feel very much at home there and, and to, to come to see it as a, a, a place that, that's there so they can uh, grow in friendship, grow in, in the knowledge and love of Jesus, have a place to pray and celebrate Mass. We have designed a beautiful chapel for the facility and uh, when you, you if you visit there now you can see the drawings. The building itself is going up and we hope to dedicate it late in, in, uh, in January. Um, so they're having mass in another space uh, right now. That's all. It's already begun. But uh, we have two priests in residence there: Father Joe Taphorn, who's the director of the, the center, and Father uh, Andrew Rosa, who's our vocations director. So, uh, we have a, a great uh, lay staff, focus missionaries. Uh, we have just a, a really rich uh, program, and um, it, it's built on a, a good campus ministry program that's been going on at UNO for a number of years. But we really saw the opportunity. We're able to find the property and and. Uh, we're raising, have raised the funds mostly. We still got a, you, you know, some of that to go, but, but can you, some of you, most of you, have been so generous in, in supporting uh, that too. And I just see the good of it already. They had the first uh, week that it was open, first week of the semester. UNO, the university itself, uh, highlights uh, activities that different organizations will will put on, uh, and almost all those are, are held on the campus itself. But they were willing to uh, highlight and sort of invite people to ours, even though it was on our property off, off of the campus. And there were, well, we, we had free food, which was also a, a draw. And that's what I was there myself for some of the free food. But um, we gave away 350 plates that night and ate up all the, the barbecue. So again, a number of, of students from all over the campus came just to see the place and, and find out, um, find out uh, where we are. So. Um, it's a, a, a great new chapter, I think, in, in the life of the community. A great uh, partnership with the, with the university. The, uh, the chancellor, um, Christensen, was at the, at the ribbon cutting and made a few remarks. And if I would have written his remarks, things I wanted him to say, it wouldn't have been as good as what he said himself, it, it, including these two things. Listen, listen to this. He talked about what a priority the faith life of the students is for him and for his administration at the university and that he sees the, whatever faith the young people are called to, that it's very important that the university support that and support opportunities for them to grow in, in, in the faith that, 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 they are, um, that they are called to. And then he said, we look around the country at great universities, uh, great secular universities, they all have Newman centers, these great universities. So he said, this now helps make us a great university. So I, I didn't disagree. But, um, but UNO is growing, as, as we know. And of course, it's in Omaha, but it attracts uh, a lot of students from rural communities throughout the diocese. And we think that the, that the Catholic residents will be a special attraction 
for rural students, not only for them, but um, because uh, we'll have an atmosphere of, there'll be college students, so I think it'll be a lot of fun, a lot of energy, but it'll, it'll be an atmosphere where, where young people can support each other in, in, in their faith at a, at a secular university. So again, I'm so proud of that uh, effort um, now coming to fruition and, and so grateful for, for all who have uh, have supported it. So continue to, you know, it's a, it's a tradition in, in our faith at the beginning of a new academic year to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon these efforts. So please uh, continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide that, um, that center as, it, as, as it's beginning. Uh, it's already off to a, to a really good start. And if you have a, a chance to stop by and uh, knock on the door, I think they'll let you in and you, you can you maybe get a tour but at least, and meet some of the students and see the good, uh, good work that's, uh, that's going on there. Um, we have a, a, a process of pastoral planning that's going on kind of continually in, in the archdiocese and in our parishes, as well as with, with the schools, of course. Um, as you know, there were 10 parishes uh, kind of a, around the perimeter of the uh, Omaha metro area that were involved in the planning process last year, and the results of that were published. We, sh we shared that with you, that the, those parishes are now in the process of implementing those, those plans, including the two uh, parishes in, uh, that uh, have a Gretna address, uh, St. Patrick's and St. Charles Borromeo. Uh, the, the next step for them is to, to do more planning internally to look at how they can uh, open a, a, a new Catholic school uh, shared by those two parishes. So where will it be? Uh, what, what will it take to get it up and going? How much will it Will it cost the parishes initially? How much will it cost year by year, and, and so forth? But our study up until now showed that that that, that it really it, it's very much a possibility. It, and if it is a possibility, we'd, we'd like to think we, we would uh, we would make it happen. So um, you can pray that that uh, discussion kind of go on through through this next year or, or so to really get buy-in from the parishioners and uh, it'll have to be at one place probably and not, not another so that they have to decide where, where that will be and, and but make sure that, that, that there is support in both parishes. Again, there, we already know that there is support but to bring that uh, to a little more focus. Uh, so then uh, our, um, our, with the help of our diocesan planning office, we, we, we plan now to look at, we have six rural deaneries, so six geographic areas in, in our rural communities, and we plan to look at two of those a year for the next three years, uh, starting in about another week or so we're gonna uh, start. And so the first, um, the, the um, uh, those deaneries will be the areas that, that are sort of Columbus and Schuyler and to the west of, of there out toward Central City, and then the, the deanery that's centered around Norfolk. So to do like we did here in the city, look at um, demographic trends, look at facilities, look at the schools, the, the parishes, attendance, so forth, um, and then begin to see what uh, what do we need as we move into the future, you know, for vibrant uh, vibrant parish life given our given our present uh, realities. That is going to be animated, especially in the rural deaneries in, in these coming years, by another process that we're just wrapping up. Um, as you know, I, I conducted a series of listening sessions uh, throughout the Archdiocese during the past winter and spring. Some of you participated in those. Uh, after we, we did the listening sessions, we looked at if, so we looked to see if there were groups of people or areas that we had hoped to hear from that we really didn't. And so we did some focus groups to try to invite a few more people to, to give us some input. Uh, really to help in, in, uh, develop a, a vision for pastoral life in our archdiocese for the next three to five years or so. So we're, it's, it's not a, a study about facilities, it's not, uh, it's not a fundraising effort, but it, it's an effort to, to, uh, to ask ourselves prayerfully, where is our Lord leading us? And we can't do everything and, and we're not going to have a revolution to throw out everything, but uh, if we were going to put particular energy in, into several areas of, of our life of, of faith, we really think we could grow and, and become the, the church that, that the Lord is calling us to be, what, what, what would that be? So I have the, the final, uh, we've had eight all-day meetings with, a, with a, a team of about 10 people that sort of reflect the, the, the complexion of the archdiocese, you might say. And we've been looking, trying to digest all this material that, that we received and, and um, develop this vision, which I, want to, uh, I plan to share with all of the priests at the beginning of October and then, then with everybody else in, in, in the diocese. But um, I'll, I'll give you a, pre a preview. And, and I don't think any of this will startle you. I don't think you'll fall off a chair when you hear it. But, but, it, but, it's, but I do think it's exciting. And uh, the fact that it's not startling uh, means we're, we're already very immersed in our faith, you know, that, that we're not making up something new about what it means to be, to be Catholic. 
One of the things that we heard in the listening sessions and, and in the, the focus groups was a, a real desire for belonging and, and um, a, a desire for, for unity within the, uh, the, the, um, the archdiocese. And, and a sense from some people that they, they wish they could belong more, or they, they felt more invested in the life of the church, or a sense from some others that they that they knew they were that or there there seemed to be other people in their in their view that that really weren't included somehow. So Father Paul was talking very beautifully of, uh, just a few minutes ago, you know, about the, um, the 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 mix of cultures that we have w within the archdiocese. Sometimes, you know, within parishes like you have uh, you see here in Fremont and in many other places too. But then other. But you know, totally in, in the diocese, we have many immigrant immigrant groups, many of them Latino, but not only that. Um, and, and so uh, we have um, we know that the Lord, uh, his his mind, his will is that there's one church. And so our part of our hope for the, over the next several years will be how can we we cultivate that that sense of unity. So um, not having diversity just for its own sake. But realizing that if there are diverse gifts, they're from the Holy Spirit, and that we could all benefit from from a sharing of, of, of those uh, of those gifts. So I have some more specific goals about how that that might be uh, accomplished. Uh, again, we're not looking at a at a secular concept of inclusivity, where we say, you know, anybody doing anything is is fine or, or welcome in the church. Again, the church has, has her integrity. But we hear this first from Jesus, but we hear it again very clearly from from, from Pope Francis that we shouldn't just be looking out the window and see who, who else is out there. You know, we're in here and, and they're out there. But uh, how, how do we go out the door at the end of mass, week by week, and, and encounter others who, who may ho be hoping to meet Jesus? We certainly know Jesus wants to meet them and, and accompany them, starting from wherever they are, to, to uh, invite them to, to be part of what, what we all, what we all in, uh, enjoy. Uh, secondly, we, we want to do just what I've been encouraging at, at, at the schools and what I said I, I would like to see happen, happen in our schools. We, we want to encourage us all to have a, a deeper personal relationship with, with the Lord. Uh, we heard that, again, in our focus groups, and not to say that people don't have that, but uh, we know that the Lord wants to have a, a, a deeper relationship with each of us than the one we're letting him have so far. That there, there's more. Uh, for us to experience in terms of, of a personal relationship uh, with, with, with Jesus. Uh, we we uh, meet him in the context of, of, of the church, but there's also a, a, something very personal there. And this was the experience of his first disciples. Uh, when Jesus called the, the disciples, he called them first to be with him. And they got to know him better. And they prayed with him. And they ate with him. And they went fishing with him. And, and, First, you know, we're able to, to trust him, you might say, and, and believe that, that he really had their best interest in, in, in mind, wanted them to become the people they were, were created to be, that they really d desired to be. But then he, in the process of getting to know him, what he was really doing was equipping them to be sent out as disciples. So that from the very beginning, the faith has never been given to us as our private possession only. It's very precious to us, but it's also been given uh, to us uh, to share. And what we, again, what we heard in the listening sessions and what I think we all realized is that there's a great sense among, especially among active, active Catholics, that we're being called to share our faith, uh, in a, in, especially in a, in a world that can be pretty coarse and, and, and not, not so religious. We, we, we'd like to do that, but we're not always sure how. We, we don't really feel we have, always have the language or we don't know what or something. So um, part of what we'll be hoping to do over these coming years is develop some, some opportunities for us to be better equipped to, to, to do that. So that whenever we I think many of us lifelong Catholics have always been a little skeptical of, of people who say too much of, want, of wanting to, to, to push their, their faith. But um, as a result, I think, or maybe too shy, uh, and uh, we'd, we'd hate to um, come before the Lord at the end of, of our lives and have, have him say to us, well, you know, you had this great relationship with me, you had the sacraments, uh, you had all this benefit, you took full advantage of it, you know, you, you had a beautiful life of prayer, but I wanted these other people to have it too, and I was hoping you might tell them about it. So, you know, it's kind of it's that simple. 
th there's, there's others who we would like to have uh, at least have the opportunity to have the same experience we do. Again, we're t it's always an invitation. That's how the, how the Lord did it from the beginning. He never, he never hog tied anybody. It, it was, but he kept inviting, 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 uh, and inviting people to start where they were. Where else can they start? Where else can, can any of us start? And then, and then finally, you, you won't be surprised you know, to know because it's at the heart of our church, but it's also uh, our, a theme of our current Holy Father. Uh, we, we want to look for new opportunities to, to uh, live uh, the gift of mercy that has been given to us in Jesus Christ, particularly in, in, in the works of mercy. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, uh, I'm preaching to the choir on all these things, I think, but, but this particularly, you, you, you all are very much on your toes in, in this respect. You know, in, in your parishes and in, in the community at large, I, I see it in, in, in so many ways. But, but particularly what I would like to see us be able to, to do is not only uh, provide care for those who are in, in special need, but, but to get to know them better. To, to see if we could create some opportunities where uh, those who, who uh, seem to need some, some particular service or, or care can be encountered by those who might have gifts to, to share with them. And that, then there might be more of an exchange of, of gifts because we get, we get to know each other better. And, and just as the video was, was trying to, to show that we're able to share our story of faith, both our joys and our struggles, a little bit more widely in the community, maybe out of our normal circle. Uh, and some of you do that, I, I know already. Um, but I'd like to think we could have some more, there might be some more opportunities to, uh, to, to do that. We're, again, we would take that personally uh, in terms of uh, maybe the encounter of another person. Uh, so um, that kind of leads me to just my final uh, remark of, uh, that's, that's related to that. You saw it, in, in, it was in the Catholic Voice a couple of weeks ago, but then the, the uh, World Herald picked up on it the other day. Uh, the, the news that our Catholic Charities is, is undergoing a, a pretty a serious process of, of reorganization. And uh, this has been going on really for the last year. They, they have an excellent board. Uh, John Griffith, who's a member of, of this group, is, is, is giving excellent uh, leadership. So there's been a very thoughtful and prayerful discussion about the, the, the future of, of Catholic Charities. Uh, we face a couple of important challenges, and as, as the article pointed out. One of them is, is uh, budgetary that we've become very involved in recent decades in, in behavioral, health, behavioral health services. There's a huge need for that, so it's a great uh, thing for us to be involved in. Uh, we, we rely on government contracts, some private funds, some donations to do that, but primarily government contracts. And as was quoted in that article, the, the funding for these programs has not, uh, there hasn't been an increase uh, in 10 years. Um, and, and so, the, in order for us to, to hire the staff and retain the staff that we need to do the, the, the good work, we're, we're losing money by the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, probably a million dollars uh, this year. So, the size of our Catholic charities, that's just not sustainable. Uh, so, um, we're going to be backing out of a, a number of these uh, government contracts, do it, doing it very uh, deliberately so that we don't, so that our clients don't lose services, so that they're able to transition to, to some other kind of care and then also so that our valued uh, staff will be able to also uh, transition uh, to, to, other, uh, to other positions. So the board and, and I, and I, I know you share this, we're very, uh, very clear that we want to, to, do it, uh, to do it that way. But what I want to share tonight, and I'll be able to do this more as we talk about this pastoral vision, uh, we're, we're not giving up on, on Catholic charities. I, I see that, especially as we make this a focus of our pastoral effort going forward, that, that, that it's going to take on a new importance. And their own board will, will be doing a, an assessment of, of what are some of the needs in the community that they feel that we, that we can meet. But particularly I'm asking them, and we'll be asking them to help, uh, help us connect parishes with, with, the, with needs and so that we can have more uh, people personally involved in, in getting to know our neighbors who, who, who might uh, uh, be in need with, with professional guidance, of course, and, and, and structure. Again, we want anything we do to be excellent uh, uh, and to be very respectful of, of the people that, that we serve. But I, I just have to think, knowing the community as I do uh, by now, that uh, if, if we provide those opportunities, that more and more people will, will want to take advantage of. So, you know, the, the overall budget will go down drastically uh, because we won't be uh, funneling really the government funds through, through our programs. But I think, uh, I'd like to think that the, that the involvement of, of our Catholic people and others who want to be with us uh, to, to um, serve the mission of Catholic Charities, really the mission of the church, that that, that can really increase. 
it's not going to happen overnight. But as we see how we how we might uh, direct our own attention and our, our resources over the next three to five years, I, I think uh, we can be there. And we see what we can do if we work together with material resources for the excellence for our schools. And I think in, in terms of our the excellence of our response to the Lord, we might say, I think we, we can do that. It's a little bit different. Uh, but I think it, it, what I have seen already gives me confidence that, that we can become an even more vibrant, uh, vibrant Catholic community. We all share a, a concern, and we heard this in the listening sessions. I hear it from you, and I have it in my own family. We share a concern about the, the youngest members of, of, of our church, the kids that are just coming up through school, but also the ones that are in college or the young adults uh, just, just kind of starting on, on their careers. You know, we, again, we want the, the faith. We want the the life and the love of Jesus, we want, we want that for them. You know, we know that they won't have it exactly like we have it, and they, and they shouldn't. Uh, that the, those desires and, and needs change from one generation uh, to the next. But I, um, we have so much uh, to be grateful for. You know, we, 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 as we look at this pastoral vision for the, the next few years, we're not coming from, from a position of weakness. You know, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not part of a church that's really seriously being diminished. But I think we, we do have, and I think our, our pre-share, there's just a, a sense that if we keep just doing what we've been doing, that the trend lines are probably gonna go down. And um, uh, the Lord it, uh, has blessed us in so many ways, I think will give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we need uh, to be transformed ourselves, which is always the, the hope, and, and then to, to be able to offer a, a, a sincere and, and um, vibrant uh, uh, invitation to, to our neighbors and to to the next generation in our, in our families and parishes to, to be part of something that, that will give them a full life in this world uh, and, and then the, the, the sure hope of, of uh, eternal life, which is God's uh, desire for them always. So thanks for listening so patiently to all that. That's a little preview. You'll be, you'll be hearing more of that. And part of the, um, the challenge of creating a culture of unity, we, we might say over the next uh, several years is to, is to communicate a, a common vision that we can that we can all, all be part of. And I, I think the more we talk about it, the more we pray about it, I think there, that, 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 that there will be an, uh, an enthusiasm um, about it. It will help them. It, it's not primarily about money or personnel, but it will help guide then how, how we direct the resources that, that are so given so generously through the annual appeal and, and through other, other things. Um, all right, so where are we? So I wrap this up. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your attention, but thanks really for your participation in, in, in the ACD. It, it's, um, it, it's, it's a big help to me. It helps me just to be able to share some of these things with all of you, share the, the good news, and, and then so I think uh, Doug maybe say some, uh, something about our hope that maybe you'll, you'll intentionally share some of that uh, with others. Thank you, Archbishop. Um, your efforts are certain to make us a stronger church. Um, at this time, if anyone has any questions for the Archbishop or any of our earlier speakers, uh, please let, let me know and we'll call them back up. Does anybody have any questions? Quiet crowd, Archbishop. Um, Archbishop Lucas and all of our speakers will be here during the social if you do have additional questions or comments. Uh, before we conclude the meeting, I'd like to draw your attention to the back of the agenda. Uh, this was mentioned earlier by uh, Shannon. As you may recall, one practical tactic that came from the recently conducted strategic study of the ACD is to offer members talking points related to the important initiatives and concerns that we can all share with our peers, neighbors, and fellow parishioners. Some important information for us to share with others. First, spread the good news about the impact the Ignite the Faith campaign has had on Catholic edu education. Excuse me. Remind people that more good will occur as more pledges are fulfilled. Second, the Archbishop's annual appeal will officially launch on September 17th and 18th. Offer positive support to your pastor and parish leadership as they invite participation in the appeal. They are key to the appeal's success. Third, encourage attendance and support of the Archbishop, Archbishop Dinner for Education, which again will be held on September 19th, excuse me, 29th, 2016. Uh, there's a reference to the website for more information and a link on the, on the uh, sheet. Uh, thanks again to all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at our next meeting, which will be a general meeting held on December 14th at Duchenne Academy of the Sacred Heart Noma. And finally, before we conclude, please enjoy the social desserts and tours conducted by none other, none other than our own Charlie Deers. 
Well, St. Patrick Catholic Church. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Now the Archbishop, could you give us a final lesson? Charlie, is this the nickel tour or the quarter tour? <laughs> Let's, um, as we conclude, before he has a chance to answer that, <laughs> let's ask um, our Blessed Mother to intercede for us, for all the, the good work of the Archdiocese, for the special intentions of, of our families, um, uh, especially those close to us who maybe are uh, in uh, need of healing, strength, in any particular way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Patrick, pray for us. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.